Okay, good afternoon, aloha. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Lee. I'm the founder and director of Academy for Creative System. I'm very happy to be here today with a friend of at least 10 years. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, let us know if you can hear us okay. Um, but Patrick Lee is the co-founder of the world's most popular movie review website. But he said he's had a few regrets since selling Rotten Tomatoes in 2004. He's 44 years old. I know he looks like a student. Uh, and is a serial entrepreneur and has launched six startups in his career, all with the same group of friends he met while studying at University of California, Berkeley. Is that right? Yep. So he also took 12 years to graduate from college. But that was only because he was too busy building companies around the world. So before we get started, where did you grow up, and what did you study, and why did it take you 12 years to graduate? Uh, I was born in L.A. My parents were from China, but they grew up in Taiwan, went to the U.S. for grad school. Uh, when I was five, moved to Maryland. Uh, my dad taught at UCLA, but then went to switch over to teach at University of Maryland. Um, so I grew up over there, and then went to UC Berkeley for college. Um, and taking 12 years, basically I left after two years to go and I uh, tried doing a startup with some friends. Uh, I convinced a bunch of us to, to leave school to do it. And then it took me 10 years to finish the last two years worth of school. Um, but yeah, uh, eventually when we were selling Rotten Tomatoes, decided it was I should actually go in and finish because I wanted to try going to Asia. And uh, I was worried if I went to Asia, I, I might not ever finish because I didn't know if I was going to go back to Berkeley. OK. So what was your major? Uh, majored in cognitive science. Cognitive science. Yeah. And do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Yep. So what, what, what does that mean for, for all the students here? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Because it's something that we really try to infuse in the curriculum here and the teaching, but I'm curious from your point of view. Um, I think it's mainly just doing something for yourself, uh, being your own boss, essentially. It doesn't necessarily mean doing a startup. I think you could still have a lifestyle business, you could open up a restaurant, and you're still an entrepreneur. Um, I think it's more just the mindset of, of wanting to do your own thing. So um, tell us about the six startups that you've been involved in. Oh. We'll, get, we'll do the long story of Rotten Tomatoes last. Okay. Tell us about the... Uh, okay, first one was a company called Human Ingenuity, selling computer systems and components um, from basically like our dorm room. Uh, not dorm, but we had an apartment some friends rented. Uh, and that's the one we left school to go and try and do. We essentially take orders from people, uh, go down, place orders, drive down an hour to, you know, Silicon Valley area, buy the parts, come back, build a computer, um, and deliver it. Second one was a design firm called Design Reactor, and we were doing interactive design, so websites, flash games. This was a long time ago, uh, and we were doing a lot of work for the entertainment industry. So a lot of stuff for Disney Channel. Uh, Warner Brothers, ABC, Artisan, Entertainment, MTV, VH1. We did the online flash game for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, for some of you who are older might have heard of that, that show, game show. Then the third one was Rotten Tomatoes. Wait, let me go back to this one. <laughs> yeah. How did you, you guys were not even out of college yet. How did you sign up people like Disney and ABC and studios to allow them, let you take their IP and do something with it? So that's an interesting story. So we, we had a sister company um, our friends started called Gamers.com. It was a gaming website. And they were working with uh, Tom's Hardware, which was a hardware website. And so the person who was running, the president of Tom's Hardware, we were helping him out. We helped them redesign their site and everything. And he, his daughter was at Disney Channel. And he was saying, hey, you know, I think it was like Comdex or something was happening in Vegas. And he's like, hey, you should come out and meet her because maybe you might be able to do some work with them. And when we went out to uh, Vegas and we met her, she was like, do you guys have a portfolio like, that you can show us? Because we just fired our lead developer. And what had happened was the lead developer, they had some disgruntled engineer or something who put a curse word into one of the web pages that made it past three levels of QA and actually went live. And this is with Disney. And if you do that with Disney, you're done. Like, they're immediately fired. And the problem was at the time, we were doing like all kinds of things for all kinds of companies. 
And so we had like nothing really that was worth showing to Disney. So when we got back from Comdex, I called up a bunch of friends from Berkeley that I knew could do art or program or something and just said, please come in. So about a dozen of us came and met up. And I said, we're going to be, we need to make something to show to Disney that we can do this work for them. And so we went on the Disney Channel website, looked at the schedule to see like what, you know, show or movie or something that they have coming up in the next few weeks that they don't have a website for. And it turned out it was, we uh, settled on a movie called Mighty Ducks 2. And so we went to Blockbuster, which still existed back then, rented the movie, watched the movie, got some pizza, had a pizza party. And then afterwards, we're like, we're building a website for Mighty Ducks 2. And then we just split up everyone who was there. A lot of them didn't even work for us at the time. They were just friends helping out. And we built a fully functioning website, icons, wallpapers, you know, cast and crew with bios and all that, uh, two working flash games, everything. And then this was literally over one weekend, sent it over to her and said, look, we don't really have a portfolio that matches what you're looking for, but we made this. And she was just like, oh my gosh, there's like no way you could have known in advance to have done this. So we, she knew we did it in one weekend. And the thing is, you know, Disney Channel has a, Disney has a very specific style guide, so it didn't quite match their style. We tried to like mimic it, but they ended up, she's like, we can't really use your website, it doesn't match, but we're interested in your games. Um, I, can't, I can't remember the second game, but one, the first game was basically Pong, that was kind of like branded as Mighty Ducks, so it looked like ice hockey. And so they ended up buying the two games from us, and at the time we were charging, you know, we were straight out of school, we were charging 500, 1,000 for these websites. And they paid us 12500 for the two games combined. You know, they sent us a style guide that was like this, this thick that we had to go through and, and look at and fix things up. But still, I mean, it was like way more money than we had ever made. And then from there, they started throwing us um, RFPs, requests for proposals on projects like, hey, can you try this? Like, send us a proposal for this, send us a proposal for this. And we did, and we kept getting more and more work from them until we got like a million dollar maintenance contract to do like 50 flash games for them over the course of a year. We built a content management system for them. And the thing is, almost every client we ever got, most of them came from Disney because the producers would move around very quickly um, to other companies. So they would take us into MTV or VH1 or ABC with them. And because um, the thing is, we were young, but we did a really good job. And our whole thing was we were there to like make them look good. So when they went to a new place and they brought us in, they're like, we, we have someone that we want to use that they knew could get the work done at a you know, probably cheaper rate than other people. Um, and so they brought us everywhere. And sorry, this is taking a little while. But when the, she had her bo a new boss come in, he actually met with us. And we were like 20, low 20s at the time. And if I look young now, I look like a little kid back then. <laughs> and when we met him, he was like, you're just a bunch of kids, like, why are we giving you so much business? And I remember, and I was like, well, look, this is Disney. You're going to give it to, you know, 40, 50-year-old people? Like, they didn't really grow up with this like we did. And this is the internet. Like, they didn't grow up with it. They don't, they don't know how this stuff works. We do. And we're younger, we're better, we're faster, we're cheaper, we're more creative than anyone else you're going to be working with that's older than us. And he was like, good point. And then he just gave us, like, way more work. So, long story. <laughs> Now, did you all have to leave school to do this, or were you doing simultaneously? Um, some of the people I worked with had left school. A bunch had grad just graduated. We did an internship over a summer where we brought in a whole bunch of people um, that we kept on, and they were like recent grads. So most everyone was like right out of school. Okay. So I know we have a few more startups to go through, but the thing I want to ask you to think about because um, one of the things we're going to do in the new building is we're going to have an incubator for student-run companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want you to leave school, but we want you to actually run your companies from the school and have your, you know, build your IP and start your LLC and everything like that. But, you know, looking at what you did then, particularly that, but in all these situations, I'm just curious, what was more important in these situations? Um, networking? Like with this Disney, someone's daughter worked at Disney or something like that, or timing, you know, someone got fired or something like that, versus talent. 
uh, versus just luck, serendipity, versus your ability to present yourself and saying, hey, we're better at this than anybody else you can hire. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about this startup, but just in general, if you could answer those kinds of, those are the life questions that they all face as they're all starting to you know, look right. for work and stuff. And we want them to go out with those skills, but to understand that sometimes it's not just skills, there's, a, there's all these other X factors that are taking place. Yeah, I, they're all super important. Um, I would say the last one, uh, selling yourself and talent, I think they're all kind of related. They're all based on people. Um, that's critical if you want to make a good product or to do your service well. Um, that's, and that's probably the one thing you can control the most. So you kind of have to have that part. Uh, luck and timing, you don't really have control over probably at all. Um, and when we go into the story of Rotten Tomatoes, you'll hear how we had a lot of bad luck. But in a way, it was also kind of good luck in, in, um, because it kind of got rid of a lot of competitors. Um, and then networking was something that we didn't, I didn't do at all, really, until after Rotten Tomatoes. So even the thing that happened with Tom's hardware and stuff, that was sort of a lucky connection. But again, if we didn't go, if we weren't so aggressive, I think we wouldn't have gotten anything with them. Um, so I, I think talent is, especially when you're in school right now, it's like the number one thing that you can work on. Um, and then you have to hope you get lucky on the timing and luck. I mean, because it makes such a big difference. I mean, it literally is like a company can IPO or a company can go out of business and can be co totally based on outside factors. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't want to wait to the end to all the questions. So if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hands and stuff like that. Be, feel free to interrupt. So, I mean, occurs to you as he's, as he's talking. We'll do questions at the end, as always. Um, uh, I want to ask you about uh, I'm going to continue this to, to, to on to Rotten Tomatoes in a second, but what what made you think or know that your college friends were the best team for you, the best choice for you to work with? Um, there's like two schools of thought, you know, on this. Some people are like, don't work with friends, and I'm actually like, absolutely work with friends. Uh, I I believe, and you know, most of my friends who are tech founders did just that. Like we have Holly here who did a company called Kabam, you know, that uh, made, was it Marvel Contest of Champions, right? And they were all friends from college as well. Um, and you look at a lot of tech companies, was Facebook and Yahoo and Snapchat and PayPal and Apple and Google, right? They're all friends from like high school or college. I actually think the single best place to find a co-founder is while you're still in school because you have that time you have people who had a, a shared experience um, as you, you get a chance to actually know them. And the thing is, yes, if it goes badly, you can hurt or lose a friendship, and that does happen a lot. But if it goes well, like one, you can trust the person, probably much more than you can some random stranger that you met at a tech conference and convinced to somehow be your co-founder. Um, two, uh, if it works out well, it's great that you can like do something ideally that you wanted to do you picked this kind of company to build, and you can do it with, you know, some of your best friends. Like that is the dream, I think. Um, so I, I absolutely believe that you should do it with friends. And also, the thing is, when you find a co-founder, I mean, that's like that's marriage. That's dating in marriage, basically. You're going to be spending more time with your co-founder than you are your own family when you're doing a tech startup, like um, than your wife or, or husband or or girlfriend or boyfriend. So you don't want to just randomly. Because once you're out of school, it's like maybe someone at work or it's like someone you meet at a conference or something. I mean, it's much harder. And at least in school, you can hopefully spend potentially years together and really get to know and trust someone. Yeah. OK, so let's go to the, the, big, the big ahi, Rotten Tomatoes. Tell us that story. OK. So while we were doing our design firm, uh, there was essentially two main competitors, myself and Stephen Wang. Stephen was our CTO, also from Berkeley, majored in co uh, computer science. We had um, this person, Sen Duong, who was our creative director. He was an architecture major out of Berkeley. And I believe he was one of the people that I had pulled during that time to try and help with Disney. And, and I knew he was always a great artist, super smart, super hardworking. He was on the same floor as me freshman year, um, just down the hall. And so I had recruited him to come in to be our creative director. 
And he was a big movie buff and a big Jackie Chan fan. And there was a movie coming out at the time called Rush Hour. And Sen wanted to know what every, all the critics were saying about that movie because he was just a huge Hong Kong movie fan. He, he got me into Hong Kong movies back in the day with you know, like Jet Li and all that kind of stuff. And so he was super excited when it was coming out. And so his idea was, you know, back in the day, you open up a newspaper, you'll see these full page ads for movies that look like a movie poster with quotes all over it. But the problem was all those quotes are always good. It doesn't matter if the movie's good or not. If it's good, it's famous film critics. If it's bad though, it's like a radio station DJ, or sometimes they even like had fake critics mm -hmm. a couple times. Right. Um, sometimes we paid them. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes the studios would wine and dine these critics secretly so that they would get a good review. And so Sen's idea was just like, well, what if I put all the, the quotes up, good and bad, but only from professional critics? And so he did that. He worked for about two weeks on the idea. And back then, most reviews were not online. So he actually go, went to the library and like pulled you know, Rolling Stone magazine and all these different magazines and newspapers out and read the reviews and wrote down a quote. Then he went back to make the website. Um, and then he launched it. And we were hosting it for him. And immediately, it started getting you know, cool side of the day or week or month you know, highlighted on Netflix, uh, Netscape, Yahoo, things like that. And, um, Later, uh, there's a film critic, Roger Ebert, that wrote an article where he highlighted his favorite 20 m movie websites, and Rotten Tomatoes was one of them. Oh. And then also, when Pixar released A Bug's Life, we saw a spike in traffic, and we were like, where's it coming from? And it was coming from Pixar. And what we, <laughs> what we realized was, you know, someone at Pixar forwarded it to everyone else at Pixar, <laughs> and they're just refreshing our page because we would add reviews as we found them. Uh -huh. And so they wanted, they're basically using us as kind of like a search engine right. for movie reviews. And so when we realized like, hey, Roger Ebert likes the site, Pixar's using it, that's when we, we realized like, hey, there's something there. And so we uh, gave our design from off to another group, uh, joined with Sen. I went out, raised a little over a million from people that we worked with as our design firm. So, so our clients what, what, what put in money. What uh, He launched it in August 98. We started going out about a year later to raise money, okay. closed funding around January of 2000, and um, brought our whole team over, just focused everything on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. And then uh, right after that, that was January 2000, March 2000, the internet stock bubble burst. Uh, it was very, very bad um, crash. Most tech companies went out of business during that time, like a ton of them. And... Um, and 18 months after the market crashed was 9-11, uh, which was also really bad. And so it was just a weird, t that's like the whole luck and timing thing. I mean, it was a really tough time, um, very bad for raising, Im impossible to raise money, very also bad for making money off of ad revenue. They went from, you know, $5, $10 CPM, like cost per thousand ad impressions to like pennies or even less than a penny. Um, and... It was a tough time. In some ways, it was good. It got rid of almost all our competitors, just wiped them all out. Because even some that had raised tens of millions, hundreds of millions, um, just completely they gone. they took your idea and some a, a tried. On it. Yeah, but it was just a lot more just too big. And when the market crashed, and not only could it not raise money, all their revenue went to nothing too. So when you have the two of those, you basically have no money. And because we were still kind of lean, we had 20-something people. We had to cut down to seven within a year. But we knew we had to, we went very quickly to a lower headcount and, um, and we were able to kind of keep the lights on. But at the same time, it was a tough time. Um, every month after those two things happened, they're like, there's gonna be another crash, there's gonna be another terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. and, and there were of both of those things, but I think nothing compared to both of those events. I mean, they were, it was pretty crazy. It was a crazy time back then. Um, yeah, and so, we, we ran it for a while. It, we eventually sold it in 2004 to a company called IGN Entertainment, which is a gaming site. It's changed hands many times. IGN sold to News Corp. News Corp sold it over to Flickster. Flickster sold to Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers sold Rotten Tomatoes over to Fandango, so Fandango owns it now. And yeah, it's, it's old. The site turned 20 last August, so it's been a, around a long time. So it's a survivor, and it's, a, yeah. uh, it's like I said, it's the world's most famous one, right? Yeah, I mean, we're just really happy, all of us, that it's still around. I've had a lot of friends that have sold their companies to, to larger companies. 
um, and most of them are like don't even exist within a couple of years. Um, because a lot of times when the company buys it, they don't really know how to run it. And two years afterwards, the founders uh, aren't locked up anymore and they leave. And once the founders leave, the company doesn't know what to do with it and then it dies. Um, so yeah, we're just happy it's around. Mm. Okay. Um, I've, re I've read a few of your interviews and a lot of them you talk about sleeping under your desk. Is yeah. that like something you have to do to be successful? Um, and why don't you tell them why you were sleeping under your desk? You don't have to. I would say, for some reason, I think all six startups I've done it. But um, with Rotten Tomatoes in particular, it's because when we had a let go of people, we were at 25, we went to 21, 17, 14, 11, finally down to seven within one year. Uh, of the seven of us, we all took at least a 30% pay cut. Myself and our marketing person, Paul, went to zero. And so for me, the way I was able to do it is I just got rid of my apartment, which was my biggest you know, fixed expense, just moved all my stuff into the office because we had you know, 20 cubes. And so I just took three cubes and put all my clothes into like the drawers. And if you close the drawers, you can't, you can't tell that someone was living there. And, and even though there's a security guard that kind of came through at nights and in the mornings, you'd just be like, I'm working late or I'm here oh, early. you didn't tell them you were staying. No, it's, oh. that wasn't legal. But um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, if you're pulling, if you're working really late combined with coming in really early, that's basically what I was doing, right? Okay. Yeah. Do they have showers in this? Uh, there was a gym downstairs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a requirement, but it doesn't hurt. Um, I don't like, you don't want people to like kill themselves doing a startup, but especially if you do it early, uh, I definitely think people should do it early. The earlier, the better. I mean, don't necessarily leave school, but like right after you graduate, it's the best time. Um, and that's also the time you probably can put more time in where you actually can pull an all-nighter if you need to. Um, you have less, a lot less risk at that point in time. You know, you, you're used to living like a college student. You know, you don't have, probably have a spouse. You don't, probably don't have kids or house payments or car payments. Also at that time, if you don't have to worry about kids, you don't have to worry about a spouse. Also, you don't probably have to worry about your parents yet. You know, if you're right out of school, you're 20, your parents are probably like 50. It's okay. Say you wait till you're 40 though, and you have kids, and you have a spouse, and at that point you probably have to potentially worry about your parents too. Suddenly, with nothing else different, that's a lot more load to do, and it's much harder to just focus on your company and yourself. And it's not impossible, people have done it, but it, it is harder, there is a, a much bigger opportunity cost. So I always tell people, if you're thinking about doing a startup, do it like right out of school. Um, and you've seen a lot of tech companies where the founders left school, like tons. Again, I'm not saying leave school, but it, it happens a lot. And there's, I think there's a reason when, why it's, a lot of them end up being very successful. You have time to make mistakes. Um, you, you know, you can go for two or three years and you'll learn a lot even if you screw up. And you can afford to make those mistakes then. But if you're older and say you're, you know, you have a spouse and all that stuff, they're not gonna let you go longer than two years of not having a job, probably putting your own money in, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just much better to do it early. So we're going to, like I said, we're going to have an incubator in the new building, but Charlotte will not let any of you spend the night or move your clothes in, <laughs> put them there. Keep track, okay? Uh, okay, so I think I counted three so far, right? Yeah. And um, I met you in Asia like over 10 years ago. Yeah. Was this the, the, the next three in Asia or what? Next what, two. The next two. All yeah. right, so tell us how you, what, you went to Asia and yeah. what was that about? And so I sold uh, in 2004. Then I proceeded to go to China to do a startup for the next three years there. It was sort of like a Yelp kind of thing. It was a loyalty program. There was actually a machine that we put into stores and stuff. People would go in with a card to swipe, to track their purchases, to so, so merchants could provide more like loyalty kind of programs to, oh. to their clients. Um, it didn't quite work because what we found was the merchants would take the machines, but they actually didn't want to swipe the cards because they didn't want to pay us. And also they were worried that if it was being swiped, the government might confiscate our servers and realize that a lot of these merchants might have had more sales than they were reporting for tax reasons. Um, oh. So that was kind of tricky. But a lot of it for me going to Asia was uh, being an ABC American-born Chinese, I wanted to see what it was like to live over there. Um, 
Afterwards, I went to Hong Kong for six years, did a startup called Alive Not Dead. Um, it was essentially like a kind of like MySpace, working with celebrities and artists in Asia to connect with each other and to their fans. Um, we did it with a, one of my co-founders was this guy, Daniel Wu, who yeah. he has a show now like uh, Into the Badlands, and he was on in Tomb Raider and some other stuff. Um, and we did, you know, official Jet Li website, official Jackie Chan website, a bunch of stuff like that. Um, that was pretty interesting. It was going back towards entertainment. We, we, that one didn't work out so well just because um, being in Hong Kong, we were essentially competing against uh, not only the U.S. social media, but also like China social media. And we were a very small team, very bootstrappy. Um, but it was just hard. We were trying to feature match with companies that had literally like 10 or 20,000 engineers, and we had three. Um, <laughs> so, but it was fun. And then the last company, I went back to the Bay Area, did another company with one of my friends from, again, from freshman year of college, uh, called Hobo Labs, and we were making mobile games. Um, so we made one game. We launched it in February of last year. Uh, we were, were proud of it, but the numbers didn't work. We didn't make enough uh, money per user versus how much it costs to acquire the user. Um, so... The game is still up. If you want to take a look, it's called Storm the Gates. Um, not really anyone playing it, though, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that was the last three companies, and that one was five years. So, so six startups. Yeah. But how many ideas have people pitched to you or thrown at you or your friends have had or you've had to get to those six? Oh, uh, most of the startups, again, it's like the thing for me was I want to do something that's interesting to me at the time. Um, with friends. That was kind of my thing. And a lot of times it's like either myself or another friend would be like, hey, let's do this and be like, yeah, that sounds cool. Um, in terms of ideas pitched and stuff, I mean, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of ones I've heard. I mean, not necessarily um, that I would do, but ones that maybe to advise or invest or other things. Um, so you hear them all the time. And, and a lot of times when I have an idea that I really like, I'll like send a quick email to myself with some quick notes about the idea. And and then later on, I'll like type at least the title of the idea into a little text file that I keep of just random ideas. I have ideas about everything, um, and I don't I don't work on them because I generally feel like you should only do one thing at a time. And most of them I'll I'll never do. But it's sort of like yeah, it's cool. I I think it's worth at least putting it on just to be like when someone creates it, you know, five years later, you're like I thought of that too, and, but I never did anything <laughs> about it. Yeah, yeah. So what's the best idea that you heard that? It never worked out for one reason or another. That I've heard? Yeah. Uh, I, I can't think of one right now. Um, okay. There was one I, I kind of liked, but I don't know if it would, was just more personally I think would be interesting, was um, I wanted to do one around uh, like a Wikipedia for families. Oh. Um, just because, you know, like, again, with family getting old and stuff, like what happens when your parents or other, unfortunately, people pass away, or whatever? It's like, where's the record of the, of of them and mm -hmm. stuff? And there's things that only they would know about each other, or your aunts and uncles. They could write say things about each other. That once they're gone, it's like nobody knows. Like mm -hmm. even now, all my grandparents have passed. Like our parents' generation will know some stuff about them, but the, my generation knows very very little. And my great grandparents like nothing. Um, right. So. I was like, it'd be kind of interesting if you could have kind of like a Wikipedia type thing that's sort of like a family tree slash Wikipedia that yeah. anyone in the family can kind of go in and edit. Right. I mean, not a great idea from necessarily from a business perspective. I just thought, oh, it'd be kind of a neat thing to have to remember things by. Yeah. Random idea. No, I think it's, yeah. I think it's really good. I, I, I got a ran. I did 23andMe. Who, anybody here done 23andMe or Ancestry.com? Just one? Yeah. Aren't you guys curious? <laughs> I, I, maybe old, I think maybe I think only old people like me do it because we're like really curious. But for some of the same reasons. But I, I uh, you know, I, it, it among other besides telling you about your health and discovering I'm supposedly seven percent Vietnamese and things like that. Um, it tells you like your relatives, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but only on my Howley side, and it doesn't tell me anything. Which I, and then I finally got a, and people can contact you if you want them to. And I got an email from. This woman who adopted a Chinese girl who apparently came from our village and wanted to know about the family village mm. and stuff. Wow. You know? Yeah. So it's kind of like that story, you know? <laughs> well, well, even for my parents, they, they fled uh, China when they were very young because of the war yeah. to 
Taiwan, they were only like right. two or three. And so I know for years, my mom would go back with some of her sisters to right. China and to go on tours in different parts of China because I think they never really grew up there. Right. Yeah. Um, just take a moment and introduce your friend who's, uh, but by the way, I should have mentioned that Patrick is here for a conference this weekend called East Meets West. I think it's the six, fifth or sixth one. It's put on by Blue Startups and they bring in uh, founders and investors from all over the world, but particularly from Asia and from the mainland and from here in Hawaii. Uh, Blue Startups is the main, most successful incubator here in Hawaii. It was started by Hank Rogers, who is a UH grad and is very famous because he is the co-owner of Tetris. So he's done very well for himself with that, and he has chosen to stay and live in Hawaii, and he's actually done a lot of startups here um, and on, on the mainland too, I think. His daughter runs the startups, and you're here for it too. So why don't you stand oh. up just for a quick and tell, because uh, she sold her company for a billion dollars. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's Holly, she did Kabam, again, Marvel <laughs> Contest of Champions. They sold to, next one? Uh, Netmarble and Fox. Netmarble and Fox, yeah. Um, and so they had a whole bunch of like, really popular games. You did like the Hobbit and... Yeah, I did Hobbit and Fast and Furious. Yeah. So we did everything you did, but on the mobile phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like what you guys are doing. Yeah, and then, so they did quite well. And then she's also a, a visiting partner at Y Combinator now, in case of, and you guys ever want to... And what is that? What is Y Combinator? It's, a, it's the best uh, accelerator out there. Oh. Um, Outside of Blue Startups. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, well, Blue Startups is like a focused one around a lo local, but like yes. Y Combinator is like a one that's... Global. They made what Dropbox, Airbnb, yeah. and we were one of the first a, a bunch of stuff. I mean, those were two of the, the two biggest, right? Yeah, there, there's. But yeah, they made Twitch. oh Twitch. Yeah, Twitch came out of there. Like so many yeah. startups came out of there. Um, yeah. So if you're ever thinking about applying, like you should definitely talk to Holly. Oh, yeah. The other friend I wanted to very quickly introduce is Mark. He actually he lives in Hawaii now. Also attending. Yeah, I'm at ACM. Yeah, also is ACM. But he was with us at. Uh, Ron Tomatoes and designer actor. So he was one of our editors. Um, so come up here and tell us what really happened. And, and, and also, <laughs> when we were doing the Jet Li website, uh, when, we had, when we switched from our design firm to Ron Tomatoes and we had to cut headcount, we basically told everyone, look, we have to cut our headcount down. Like, please find something. And we kept everyone employed until they could. We also accelerated their vesting so that they still had some equity. And Mark, at the time we were doing the Jet Li website, and Jet Li just ended up straight hiring him to work on the official Jet Li. So he was Jet Li's webmaster for nice. 10 webmaster. years. 10 years. Wow. And like worked out of Jet Li's house. So that was kind of cool. Wow. Yeah. And now he's over here. So let me ask you a question that I ask myself all the time. Do you think you know what you're doing? <laughs> um, you just kind of figure it out as you go along. Uh -huh. um, Entrepreneurs are stubborn people. They tend to learn through their mistakes. And so I've made a ton of mistakes. I mean, literally out of the six companies, really only one has kind of broken out and really became known. The other five had hit some dif at different points of success. But yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's super stressful doing a startup. Um, the amount of time you put in, it's ridiculous. And uh, I mean, there's many times when I was like, wow, it'd be nice to just work in a normal job where you can go home and you don't have to like think about your day job. You know, someone working at McDonald's that goes home, they don't think about making Big Macs, probably, <laughs> right? But with a, with a startup, it doesn't matter what kind of startup or probably any kind of business, you never can really 100% detach. Like even if you're on vacation, you're still thinking about it. You're still probably answering emails and stuff. Um, yeah, and then there's pressure of, you know, uh, investors, your employees, your co-founders, um, even your personal reputation and everything. So um, the time, it's crazy. The stress can be crazy, especially when it's not going well. That's the worst. Um, but everyone kind of knows the risks they're going into. You know, maybe they're going because they're working with friends, which is in our case, or doing something they like. Um, in some cases, when it does work out, you know, you look at Facebook or Google or some of these ones that go really crazy, you could be the first thousand, you could be the thousandth employee and you probably still came out of it a millionaire. Um, and if you were in the first, at Google or Facebook, the first 10, you're, you're like a billionaire. You know, I mean, that's not bad. I mean, so people are taking risks going in, but, you know, even with us at, at our design firm, a lot of people, we had to let go of a lot of people. Again, we gave, we vested, um, accelerated their vesting so they had more equity and we 
kept them hired until they found something else. So they weren't unemployed at any point in time. A lot of them did quite well. One guy went to Fox Sports, was handling their stuff there, uh, went to Google later. Um, one guy went to Blizzard, has, is still there, and he was one of the lead user UX guys for Hearthstone. And he's done like really, really well. Um, we had folks go to uh, ILM, Pixar, um, WeChat. So most of them landed uh, on their feet. Actually, I think all of them did pretty well, yeah. Um, and we still all stay in touch, too. Like, pretty much, I think every year I will see a good number of, of the old Rotten Tomatoes crew. Um, yeah. I think I also read that when you, when you did sell to IGN, you, you were very concerned about paying back your investors. Right. So we had offers um, from different companies earlier that would have gotten us, you know, 10 cents on the dollar, 25 cents on the dollar. And our investors actually at the time were like, please take it because everything else they invested in during that time went to zero because the market had crashed so badly. And so they lost everything um, that they invested. Uh, but for us, we were like, you know, we got to break even. We're not losing money anymore. We might as well hold off until we at least sell and investors can get 100% of their money back. And when we sold, they got, I think, 1.7x of what they put in, which at that time was really good for them considering they lost on everything else. Looking back, yeah, if we timed it better or we optimized our sale better, I mean, we definitely could have done a lot, a lot better than we did. Um, but, you know, we didn't know. Um, it was something that we, it, you know, the product of the time. Yeah. So you had a lot of pressure from different, different places. Yeah. Now, but a million dollars in 1998, when you, how do you raise them? I mean, that, that, I mean, it's a lot of money now, but it was really a lot of money in 1998. How do you, how do you, you're 22, 21? Uh, 24. 24. Why does somebody give you a million dollars? So actually at that time, before the crash in 2000, there actually was a decent amount of money out there. We probably could have raised more um, because this was like when all the companies were IPOing um, before pre-crash. Uh, we, we just raised what we thought we needed. Looking back, that was actually a little bit of a mistake. The way, reason why we were able to raise was we were raising from folks that, we, that were our clients at our design firm. So we had worked on them, with them, to build websites, things like that. And so when we were actually raising money, we just went to them. And they're like, yeah, they already knew what we could do. So even though we were young, they had already worked with us. Yeah. So what do you need to raise now? Because you, you fund companies now, right? That's what you do, right? Yeah. For us, uh, we see companies sometimes coming in raising no money because YC likes to be the first, first money in. What is? Uh, tell them what YC is. Uh, sorry. So YC um, is a seed investing company. So just like he's building an accelerator here, it's, it's very much similar, except for we have money. I, I don't know if you're going to invest money, but we invest 150. No, we're going to give them couches, but the that's couches. that's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't so couches. That's, yeah. And, sorry. And YC, we give you 150 thousand dollars in exchange we take seven percent of your company um, and then you're in this three month program uh, to where we help you grow your your startup and then at the end of three months we bring all the silicon valley investors from china la from all over and you present um so that, that's that's kind of uh so some people have uh, a good number have not raised any type and that's the first money they get is from y combinator or yc YC's for short um, and then come demo day, we see anywhere between uh, half a million all the way to, I want to say like three million. Three million. Yeah, so I will say back in the day, our time, our startup, we started in 2006. Um, our series, our, our, so they, 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 they name them different things. It's seed, series A, series B, series C. So seed is your first money, and we got 500,000. And then at Series A is four million, and there are some founders that are raising four million at C. So there's so much more money earlier on, and I think a lot of people are spending money on actually marketing now. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so crowded, which is not best. Anyway, so and it, it okay. has changed a lot. A, mil a million's a lot back then. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I read a quote from you. Uh, where you said, all my companies, I wanted to do something with friends and something that is interesting at the time. 
I never optimized around money, and I still don't really care about it. Mm. I have always valued time, and the older I get, the more I value time, and the less there is of it. What I realize now is money can give you time. Looking back, I think it might have been smarter for me to optimize a little bit more around money. What does 44-year-old Patrick tell 18-year-old Patrick? 18. Or... 18-year-old. Well, 44-year-old Patrick would tell, uh, what is it, 30-year-old Patrick to hold off on selling Rotten Tomatoes for a couple of years. Um, <laughs> 18, uh, I think to maybe have done a slightly more of a balance between the two. Um, like I said, I, I'm not, I, I think materialistic, like I don't care, I don't need a private jet or fancy clothes or cars or watches or whatever. I mean, just look what I'm wearing now, right? Um, he got off the, the plane with a one backpack. That yeah, it. yeah. Um, but like I said, uh, money can give you time. That's what I've seen. You know, a lot of my tech founder friends, multiple of them have sold their companies for a billion dollars, like multiple of them. And the biggest thing, a lot of them didn't actually change that much. They're not splashing cash around or whatever. But the nice thing is they're retired. If they're, if they're working, it's because they choose to work. A lot of times they're investing, but they're just working on projects that are like truly interesting to them. And I guess I did that as well. But you know, um, there's there's things like they can do some nice things for their family. They don't have to stress. I mean, essentially, if you retire, you basically have twice as much many hours in a day for yourself. If you can hire a cook or a nanny or whatever. And so definitely, I realize as you get older, I'm like, money can give you more time. And that's something that I value. I'll, a lot these days. I've, I've been taking a break for the last few months, just traveling, seeing friends and family, and, and I think it's super important. So I think one thing I would have definitely told myself back then is, is to pay a little bit more attention to that because I was almost like, almost like anti-money, like I don't care about this stuff, you know, it doesn't matter. But actually, as a CEO, like I should have put more effort into that, like spend more, a little bit more time negotiating on each deal, um, trying to get a little bit better results on stuff. Um, and especially, yeah, with the sale around tomatoes, like there's a lot more stuff I could have done there. Um, one huge mistake I made uh, early on was I didn't network at all, zero. Um, yeah, we lucked it out with the whole Disney thing, but um, all three, my co-founder Steven, Sen, and I were all quite introverted, very shy. I mean, Mark, Mark knows. And we didn't have like any network at all. Like we didn't know anybody. We were happily in, in this place called Emeryville, which is near Silicon Valley in San Francisco, but not in those places. Also, we were a movie site, but we weren't in LA. So we didn't know any studio people outside the marketing people who were buying ads from us. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know really any other startup people. We didn't really know VCs because we had raised from angels. And we didn't go out and network with those people. And so one thing I think I made a big mistake on was with Ron Tomatoes, had we had more of a network, we would have had a better idea of like, should we sell? Is this the right time to sell? How do you sell? What's the right process? Getting more competitive offers, things like that, like to optimize on it. Instead, I just went in and like, I did it with everything else. Like, I'm just gonna do it by trial by error. But what I realized now is like, there's not many times you get to try it, right? To actually sell a company. Um, and so it's not the kind of thing that you can really do by trial by error unless you're just amazing at, at making products that always can get to the point of, of selling. Um, so that's a place where I really needed more of a network. And so after that, uh, even though I, I realized like it's very, very unlikely I'm ever going to have another Rotten Tomatoes, but I said, you know what, this is, this is a huge weakness for me. The networking, the fear of public speaking, I was terrified. I would dodge anything like this. And, and, and I went to try to fix those things. So like with public speaking, I actually took acting classes, like these two-day intensive acting classes in, when I was in Hong Kong. I did it twice. Uh, and not to learn how to act, and I realized how hard it is to act after taking those classes, um, but to deal with my fear of public speaking because it forced you to get up in front of people, uh, probably it was like eight to 10 people for two days straight, just over and over and over, and you start getting used to like, what, what is you know, the fear of being in front of people, and after a while you start getting used to it and it's not that scary anymore. Although, like a live camera thing still makes me nervous. Um, and, and then with networking, that was another place I thought I was I was really, really bad at it. And one of the things I started doing was being much more proactive about like, I realized like I'm really organized and I'm really good at following up. And so I started leveraging those things to help me. 
So I started organizing dinners. I actually have a group of tech founders that I, I run with, with Holly, actually. Um, it's like 140 amazing tech founders around the world, uh, including a lot of the, the folks we had mentioned before. And we do dinners every, uh, almost every month, you know, get like 20 people together, have one person speak, and just meet each other. It's like a support group. Um, I do the same thing in LA with a mix of tech and entertainment people. Um, and I started doing a lot of those, uh, getting out there with conferences, when people come up and meet with me. Uh, one thing I, I realized is like a lot of people, they don't follow up. So you go to a conference, you, you have passed out a bunch of business cards, 90% of those people will never write back to you. Um, I write back to all 100% of those people. Unless someone came up to me, gave me a card, didn't talk to me, and just walked away. Those people I don't <laughs> respond to. But everyone else, yes. Um, and, and like everyone here, if you want to, find me on LinkedIn, add me. Like say that you saw me speak today and I'll accept it. And if you have questions, even message me on there and I'll, we will respond. But even when I say this, like 10% of you, maybe 20% of you will do it. I mean, maybe now that I said that, maybe a little bit more, but actually, <laughs> but you'll be surprised because I do this at like every conference and it usually is like 10 or 20%. Like people just, they just don't do it. And it's, it's kind of crazy to me, but I was like that before. And then I realized like a network makes a huge difference. Even the groups we run, they've invested in each other. They invest together in other projects. They share deals. They partner together. They've started companies together. Um, and I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And if I had the network I have now, back then, it would have made a, a huge difference. And this is something you guys can even do now because this group of you that are all in the ACM together, right, like five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years from now, you guys are gonna be the producers and directors and all these things out there. And when you wanna make a film, you should be going back to this network. When you're trying to raise money for a project, you should be going back to this network. Like, make these connections. Don't just come to here and take some classes and leave. Like, connect with everyone. Everyone who's sitting here is someone who's probably inter interested in entrepreneurship. And make sure you're all connected uh, and stay in touch when you're out of school um, because it's huge, it's super valuable. So, I read another quote where you said, uh, it'd be a lot harder for a website like Rotten Tomatoes to grow in the climate now with little to no funding. When we started, it was web focused. Now it's about mobile. That way we got a lot of traffic. The way we got a lot of traffic was through search. The younger generation now doesn't use the web that much. It's more about apps. So at this campus, we really try to stay nimble and abreast of all the constant changes in content creation and distribution platforms. What's, what else is different about the business today from when you got started, even though you're still very young? And where, in general, where do you think things are going? Um, well, with consumer, yeah, it's just like what you said. Back when we were doing it, it was all about the web. And you could get a lot of traffic through. What we did was search engine optimization. So it wasn't that people were searching for Rotten Tomatoes. They were searching for an actor, a movie, or a director. And we happened oh. to show up pretty highly. And that you could get for free. We basically just optimized around improving our rankings in those areas. Um, with apps, though, for there was a brief period of time where uh, people started doing the whole viral loop. Hey. Get, can you give me access to your contact list so I could spam everyone on your contact list? You know, Facebook and MySpace were doing it back in the day. All the early apps were trying to do that. They were doing it, the, face, the apps on Facebook were doing stuff like that very aggressively too. Then after a while, people, re the companies themselves started clamping down on it and also users got smart. Nowadays, no one lets anyone touch their app contact list, probably, um, unless it's a messaging app you might be like, okay, fine, you can access my contacts. But some random app asking, if you're smart, you're like, no, don't, don't do that, because they're gonna spam everyone, you know. Um, and, and so without that, with mobile, sometimes it can still go viral. Uh, you know, if you make some funny video and people happen to start sharing it, and it has your like, logo on it, like a, I don't know, like a TikTok or one of those kind of things. But otherwise, if it's not that, it's, it's through paid acquisition. So it's like you're buying users. Um, and generally to do that, you need to make money from every user. You need to make more money from a user than it costs to acquire that user. So that's something that Holly did a lot with Kabam, right? It's, you know, like a, a clash of clans, a clash royale, right? They're making a lot per user, they can spend a lot, and it's very expensive, especially in some categories, to be buying users. I mean, it can be, what, $5, $10, oh, even? 
even twenty-five dollars to acquire one one install, like it's pretty insane. Um, so that's why it's it's tough. If you're just a random uh, app developer these days and you have no money for marketing, like you got to pray you get lucky and get in like an uh, Flappy Bird or you know one of those kinds of things. But it's super rare. I mean, there's literally was it like five hundred games released per day? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So it, it's a it's a different time when we did it. There weren't that many even websites out there so 20 years ago. So now everything's apps and there's a ton of them out there. As far as where things are going, um, I mean, in terms of technologies, the stuff, the areas I find the most interesting that I know zero about, but I feel like are going to change society as we know it um, over the next 10 to 50 years is artificial intelligence. If at least the positive version of it, if they do it right, I mean, it could be the next industrial revolution, you know, where because it can do a lot, of, potentially can do a lot of stuff that no one wants to do, um, it can free people to do other things. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of times they talk about like, well, isn't that bad? You're going to get people out of jobs. Well, yeah, when industrial revolution came out, like, there's a lot less people who needed to be farmers. It used to be like 100% of people were farmers or almost, right? But then after that came out, it's like you have tractors and you have all these other things that a very small percentage of our, of our society now are, are farmers, but they can actually farm enough to, to supply food for everyone. And everyone's standard of living went up. And I think artificial intelligence can do that. Um, and then the other area is you know, biotech, genetic engineering, stuff like that. Um, potentially with, with things like CRISPR, they might solve cancer and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And it, I think they're already starting to solve or make progress in a lot of those areas. And I think that's super amazing as well. So I think those are two very, very interesting areas. Um, I don't, Holly, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> I think it's like very similar. Not, I, I don't think it's too different. There's probably some certain sectors that are currently ignored. Like I'm, I'm always big on elderly tech. Mm. Everyone's gonna get old. And and they don't know how to use tech. Yeah, I can't wait till I'm in old right. folks' home. I'm going to make Tinder right. for old people, and I don't okay. change a thing. So <laughs> maybe, like, Snapchat UI or anything. I just need to swipe. Yeah. But, like, like she want, for people. those of you in the back, she wants to make Tinder for old people. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because, and then, uh, voice. I, I certainly think... Uh, I, I think, think it's because it. just you just go this way or this way. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. So maybe up and down. Maybe yeah. up and down. Maybe up and down. Maybe tap, tap. Okay. <laughs> and then voice? I do think voice is... is what do like you mean by voice? Um, you mean like Alexa and all that stuff? Yeah, or? yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's everywhere. It's on our phones. Right. It's like... If, but I think it's... The, the technology... They, they, they just shut down FaceTime, right? Because they found this bug in it that... Oh, yeah. Can, you can record. You can... You can but how many people here use things like Alexa or Google Home or any of those things? What about Siri or Google Voice or whatever? Any of that kind of stuff? Siri... I mean, one thing I noticed when I, I was visiting a lot of family this, this past year when I was taking a break um, and staying with all of my cousins, and all the ones who had kids have like an Alexa or a Google, yeah, yeah. what's the Google one called, Google Home? Google Home. Yeah, mm. at their home. And they're using it all the time. And It was the big seller at Christmas this year for Amazon. Ah, yeah, I mean, they'll yeah. just be like, you know, the kid's playing video games and he won't stop playing Fortnite, and, and they're like, three minutes left, and the kid's like, okay, okay, and they'll be like, Alexa, set alarm a timer for three minutes, just things like that. Like, and they were doing it, and they're super integrated. And I don't do that. And I was just like, "Whoa, this is really interesting." Mm -hmm. And I can, I can kind of see it when they have the kids, and they're always like, "Whatever." It's easy. They just say what they need, and it just happens. It's that's actually pretty cool. I think no matter what you do, it's always good to have a network. Um, in, you know, it was like it doesn't matter what you know versus who you know, um, something like that. Yeah. But or I, I think both are super important. Um, and you know, even if you're a cinematographer, you may need to find work, or you may need to find folks that you would work with. And and again, having that network is super important. I mean, if you're in LA, it's all about who you know, right? Um, in the Bay Area as well. So definitely, again, you need to work on your talent, like. Get good at that as good as you can. Um, and one course of action I recommend anyone who's creative is like do things. You know, a lot of times people talk about things and they want to be this and they want to be that, but they just don't do it. And they're like, oh, I don't have enough money. I don't have this or that. But it's like get on YouTube and just start putting stuff up. Like you can 
do with your phone. And actually, there's a lot of amazing things I've seen just like literally with a phone and they shove it on YouTube and show what you can do. And, and even if you're, and a lot of people are like, I won't put it up because it's not perfect. It's like, no, just stick, start sticking stuff up. Just get in the habit of like putting something up every day or maybe start with like once a week and, and just do it quickly. And that's how you get experience and then let people see it. And then you, the business aspects are like, how do you figure out how to get people to even see it in the first place? How do you get the word out? You know, is it on social media? Like, is it how you tag your stuff, you know, and learn those things. Um, that's something that everyone should do, even if they're creative, I think. Um, so that would be my recommendation, is just do it. No, I mean, not when we ran it, there was nothing like that. I mean, we would get point things where, um, when a movie came out, the, the worst for us is if we had an ad campaign that was going to run, when they buy the ad campaign, they don't know what the rating is. We don't know what the rating is. And when they buy the ad campaign, we are praying internally that it comes out fresh because when it comes out rotten, they go crazy. And we've had them you know, threaten to pull the ad campaign. And we're like, There's, we can't do anything about this. We can't change the review. Someone buys ads on the site. For a movie, and then the movie comes out rotten. And the movie comes out, and it gets like 20%. And then they will fight. Well, and actually, they, they fight less when it's 20%. When it's like, because the 60% is a cutoff between fresh and rotten. Okay. If it's like 59%, they are going to go fight super hard to get it to 60. <laughs> and they'll go in, they'll read every negative review okay. to be like, these ones are actually positive. And sometimes we'll reread it, and it's like, oh, it might be. And then we'll check with the critic. And, and there have been some <laughs> random cases where actually... It wasn't clear, and the critic's like, yeah, actually, that is fresh. Um, or, but they'll also do things like try to shove up, like, you missed all these reviews, and they give us a bunch of, you know, radio station DJ reviews, and we're like, no, those don't, <laughs> those don't count. Um, but they will fight, they'll threaten, um, and that's happened, and it, uh, from what I understand, it still happens now. Uh, I think the closest thing to a scandalous that I can think of is maybe a year ago or something, there's, Ron Tomatoes was trying to introduce some new show on Facebook, like see it, skip it, or something uh -huh. like that. And as to try to drive awareness for the show, they held off on the reviews for, I think it was Justice League, and maybe another movie or two, but oh, I think yeah, it was specifically- was a, was a Justice League thing. Specifically, it was, it was Justice League. Yeah. And, and so the movie was about to be released. It should have had a score, but the score is like hidden, waiting for the show to come out, which was gonna yeah. come out right before the movie came out. Yeah. And I think the problem was, this is when they were still owned by, Dis uh, by Warner Brothers, yeah, okay, and Justice yes. League is, is right. Warner, Warner Brothers. Brothers and yes. so everyone's like, right. you know it's going to be rotten. Like, you're holding it back right. so that people don't see that rotten rating. Yes. And I don't know for sure. I wasn't there. But it was bad. I mean, I had people messaging me and complaining. And I'm like, I don't run it anymore, but I'll, <laughs> I'll pass the note it on. It and was rotten. They were both yeah. rotten. Yeah, it was very rotten. <laughs> okay. and, and, then, oh, and the thing yeah. is, though, the, the VP that was in charge of Rotten Tomatoes at the time <laughs> was gone soon after. Yeah. So that's the closest thing I can think of to Scandalous. So uh, it's the end of the class, uh, but he's very generous. I actually got off LinkedIn because I don't like strangers contacting me, <laughs> but he loves it. And I know he's going to stick around. And if you have other questions, you can come up and um, take pictures, ask questions, whatever. But we want us to say thank you very much, Patrick, for joining us today. Thank you.